This is the College of Complexes, and we have one very important rule, which is one who at a time. That means that we try to keep the level quiet around here so that people can hear what is being said and uh, what is being objected. <laughs> All right. We have Nancy Wade, who is our candidate Napoleon. for the Green Party. Time do you want? Shortages of viable progressive solutions to the economic and environmental challenges that we find ourselves facing. What there is a shortage of is political fortitude. We need progressive champions, representatives who are not beholden to the corporations, unbought and unbowed. I am such a progressive champion. I became interested in this because it is time for us as progressives to vote our values. For too long we've looked to the Democratic Party to stand up for us, and it's not working out so red hot. It is abundantly clear now that both parties are two sides of the same coin, and that coin is engraved in big corporations we trust. I don't take corporate donations as a Green Party candidate. I take individual donations, and if anyone's feeling generous this evening, Wade in Congress is the name of the campaign. Checks can go to Wade in Congress. Now, in the 5th Congressional District, we do have a choice, for a real choice for real change. To send me, a progressive champion, to Washington to represent the 99%, not the 1%. I got into community activism, uh, actually, I got into activism back in the 70s in the feminist movement. But more recently, I was a community activist when my children were growing up. And the welfare of my children and of all children is still a big motivator for me. As a community activist, I led fights to close down a drug house that was on my block fights that were successful to get a playground at our neighborhood school and to get down zoning to protect our neighborhood from predatory developers. Um, later on, I earned a master's degree in teaching and I taught for two years in the Chicago Public Schools. And that experience has given me the perspective to be extremely supportive of the Chicago Teachers Union and the public schools. I still teach. I teach enrichment programs to preschoolers and to elementary students. In 2008, I became a volunteer organizer with Move On. And for two and a half years, I was part of a group that citizen lobbied the incumbent in the 5th District, Mike Quigley. And we discovered that on anything that we as progressives uh, cared about, we would find out where he stood after he voted. Then we'd know. For instance, on the Affordable Care Act, when the Democrats were, were counting votes, every single vote mattered to pass the Affordable Care Act. The week of the vote, the day of the vote, when we contacted Mr. Quigley, we were told he was studying it. When we asked him to support Elizabeth Warren for, the, for heading the Consumer Protection Agency, he was studying that. The SOPA and PIPA laws, that could change the internet so that it was totally controlled by big corporations. Study those. Just recently, however, we found out how where he stood very solidly when he voted with Republicans to extend the FISA 
uh, provisions that allow warrantless surveillance on all Americans for the next five years. He voted for that. So we know for sure that he's not uh, thinking about whether or not we should continue to have our civil, civil liberties. In short, Mr. Quigley has act, acted like a placeholder for the Democrats. He hasn't been fighting for us. He's just going along to get along. And what we need are fighters, because the crises that we face are too immediate and too large for just to have someone going along to get along. Do you want another beer? When Occupy showed up last September, they inspired a lot of people to take courageous steps, and I was one of those. I decided at that time to run for office, to be the change that I wanted to see in the world, and to be a progressive champion, to stand up for the 99%. I advocate these progressive solutions, fairness in taxation and a Robin Hood tax. Pass the Buffett rule to start undoing the inequities in our tax structure. Right now, the top well holders pay a significantly smaller percentage in taxes than do the rest of us. Beyond that, the marginal income tax should return to pre-1981 levels. And, and the transaction tax should be charged on Wall Street transactions. Those who have gambled with our economic future should pay back for the common good. With these funds, create jobs that benefit our communities. What we need now is a modern day WPA. Millionaires and billionaires paying their fair share using these funds to create youth core, senior core, education core. There's a crime that we are laying off teachers in the city and in this country when they are so needed for the future of our students and, our, and our, our, the well-being of our country. Mental health facilities need to be funded. Services for communities that have been hardest hit by the regressive policies of the last 30 years. Invest in environmentally responsible energy, such as solar, wind, and geothermal. Initiate programs to promote cons conservation on an unprecedented level. Much of the energy that we use is simply wasted. 40% of it just evaporates out of the walls of our buildings. We can turn around our dependence on non-renewable energy by pushing forward on aggressively on conservation. And in doing so, we can create millions of jobs in the new green sustainable economy. End the wars and cut the basic military budget by 25% over the next decade. National defense has become the nation's largest employer. It is the number one employer of young people. We are in the position that societies throughout history have found themselves in when they devote a majority of their resources to the military, they go bankrupt. And that is where we are headed right now. We must use the money here at home to provide sustainable jobs for our young people so that they are not looking to the military machinery for their for employment because they see few other options. Lift the student loan debt burden. Forgive unreasonable student debt. Create a modern day version for everyone of the GI Bill that allowed our fathers and grandfathers to pursue higher education. The original GI Bill spurred economic growth and creativity for a generation. We need the incentive of free higher education to do the same for us now. Universal health care through Medicare for All. The U.S. is the only advanced country that does not provide for this basic human right for its citizens. We must remove the profit-taking middlemen from our health care system. No insurance company should be involved in our health care. They don't do anything for us. The only thing they have ever relieved us of is money out of our pocketbook. Taking insurance companies out of the health care equation would immediately reduce costs by 40%. Get the big money out of politics. All political contributions over $1,000 should be disclosed. Can't, all candidates should have public financing after showing a reasonable threshold of support. And the Constitution must be amended to read that corporations do not get the rights of human beings Corporations are not people, my friends, and money is not speech, it is property. 
reorganize mortgages and resurrect the Glass-Steagall Act. One of the biggest drags in our economy right now is the housing market. Underwater homeowners should be able to reorganize their mortgages under bankruptcy. That alone would go far toward moving our economy forward. Without it, it will take more than 10 years to undo the current damage in the housing market. The Glass-Steagall Act would break up the biggest banks so they're no longer too big to fail and thus dependent on taxpayer bailouts. Something that is absent that the, that the presidential candidates are not talking about is our environment. We need a national defense plan for the environment, a national environmental defense plan. Our, our planet is under siege, and the U.S. is the world leader in using fossil fuels. We should be the world leader in moving away from fossil fuels toward alternative energy, toward the clean, green, sustainable future that we all deserve. Every decision we make must take into account human activities impact on our planet, on which we all depend, on which every living being depends. Stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. Stop fighting wars for fossil fuel interests. Immediately turn our full attention and political will to adopting alternative fuels and conservation of energy. And revitalize our economy in the process. As I've been going door to door in the 5th District, I'm finding that voters are ready and eager for real choice and real change. It's time to stop doing the same thing and expecting a different result. It is time to support me, a Green Party progressive candidate, in the 5th Congressional District. Thank you. So I believe this is a time for questions. Yes. Patrick. Yes. How many Green Party? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we'll ask you both questions. Oh, okay. All right. You have to wait on that, Patrick. Uh, let's see. Um, Rob is right here. All right, Rob. <laughs> Rob Sherman. Okay. Hey. Good evening. I'm Rob Sherman. Uh, I'm here because I'm the chairman of the Cook County Green Party. I'm here to speak on behalf of Jill Steiner, candidate for president, and also to speak briefly on behalf of our three candidates for Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. But before I begin, I'm going to throw you several uh, quick little curves. First, uh, in regards to Nancy. Nancy Wade is probably the most highly qualified candidate for public office that the Green Party in Illinois has ever put forward. She has a lifelong history of social justice advocacy, of uh, social activism. Uh, she uh, uh, reflects our values. She's progressive. She's a genuine Green Party member. So I ask all of you to not only vote for Nancy, if you live in the district, but also to contribute to her campaign, and Nancy and Walter will tell you all about that. And speaking of Walter, Walter mentioned that there's a presidential, mentioned to me, that there is a uh, third party candidate presidential debate on Tuesday. Walter, come up for a moment. Walter Pittuck is the uh, 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 campaign chairman, is that right? Campaign manager. Camp, as I said, uh, Walter is a campaign manager for Nancy, and uh, Walter is going to take a moment to tell you about the, the third party uh, presidential, third party candidate presidential debate taking place at the Conrad Hilton or Chicago Hilton uh, uh, down at the 700 block of South Michigan this Tuesday with uh, Larry King moderating, and uh, uh, it's being run by an organization called Free and Equal with uh, Christina Tobin. Uh, running that show. So Walter, tell us about that. Uh, you pretty much said everything that I need to say. Um, it'll be on Tuesday, the 23rd, uh, next week. I believe at 8 o'clock. And like um, uh, Mr. Sherman said, that Larry, Rob, Rob Sherman said, 
Larry King, the Larry King, will be the moderator of the debate. So this will be a debate between uh, Jill Stein, who was arrested actually at the last debate because she just she just tried to walk in and you know they said I'm not gonna have, you know not gonna have, not gonna have any any of that. So it's gonna be between um, the people that who are really driving the conversation that people are looking for in this country. It'll be Jill Stein from the Green Party, Rocky Anderson from the Justice uh, Justice Party. Um, I believe Virgil Good of the Constitution Party and uh, Gary Johnson from the Libertarian Party. So unlike the, I, I want to call them ideas that you see on TV with Mr. Obama or, and Mr. Romney, you'll have to see real ideas. You, mean, you might not agree with some of them, but you'll, you'll know that these are genuine people who are, they really believe in what they believe in. Now, they don't believe, they believe in public service, they don't believe in self -interest. So hopefully you can come to that. Um, I believe tickets are twenty-five dollars, ten dollars for low-income and students. Um, there are there is a section of Green Party supporters. If you would like tickets, um, it, uh, please see me after the after the talk or Nancy, and uh, we can arrange to get them for you. I think you still have to pay something, but uh, there's a section reserved for us if you want to come with us. So that's all I have to say. Will it be televised? Um, there are, I believe, like Russia Today and a few other. Um, Al Jazeera, I believe, is is um, covering it. CNN hopefully should be there, and hopefully the other major uh, major uh, news networks should be there. Um, it's sponsored by the Free and Equal um, Organization. I forget what their what their official organization is called, but you can just look up Free and Equal Elections uh, on Google, and you can find their website. Uh, so, yes, question. Were you joking when you said Russia Today and Al Jazeera is going to cover that? No, I'm not. The, the, yeah, they'll be there. Yeah. And, you know, you should be uh, bugging the CNN and MSNBC and uh, Fox News to come so that the broader electorate can see that they're just more than two, two voices. Yes. Where is that at again? Hilton. Uh, at Hilton, right? The debate is going to be at the Hilton. The NAG C SPAN cover it too. Uh, it's going to be at the Chicago Hilton and Towers, uh, uh, known to us uh, uh, senior citizens as the Conrad Hilton, uh, that, that hotel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that, that's where it's going to be. It's, it's going to be Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, you can purchase tickets. Uh, for more information, freeandequal.org, F R E E A N D, equal.org. Uh, and that has uh, information on uh, uh, who the broadcasters, including Elvis and uh, Jazeera and that other group, uh, I don't remember the name that, that Walter mentioned. Uh, so you can watch the debate, you can attend the debate, uh, tickets are available. I think tickets are $25, uh, uh, so if, if that's something you want to do, uh, you can go and attend the debate. But that, that's something that, that uh, you'll uh, might be interested. Thanks, Father. Uh, just one more thing before I let um, leave the uh, Rob um, go ahead and talk. Um, that the Green Party and Jill Stein she'll be having um, uh, either a post or pre party of the day of, and perhaps a uh, Wednesday uh, social event, Wednesday night, um, the twenty fourth. That's still in the works. So if you want um, more news about that, you could sign up for our email list, Nancy's email list, and we'll certainly let you uh, let you know about those events. Two more real quickie announcements uh, that I'll tell you about Jill Stein. One, there's a new radio uh, news service out there called CNN Radio. Why don't you take up 30 seconds and, and tell people about CNN Radio? Do a little well, PSA. You know what a PSA okay. is. Come on up to the microphone. Well, uh, I'll just I'll just say real quick. I we're new, you know we don't want to be part of the story. So I, I know you don't want to uh, be part of the story, but CNN, I invited you. So okay, just come on uh, up and, so everybody can hear you. All right. Hi, I love putting people on the spot. Yeah. Um, thank, you. thank you for letting me uh, kind of get in your way. Um, I'm here because of the occasion of the Tuesday debate. Uh, Nova Safo, my name is Nova Safo. I am with CNN Radio. I'm a correspondent there. And uh, CNN Radio used to be an AM news service for AM radio stations around the country and is now a uh, digital online radio service. And I'm here to cover, to do a story about the role of third party candidates in our current election cycle, uh, which will air the day of the uh, debate, the third party debate on Tuesday. So, nice to meet you all, and thank you for letting me crash your party. Hey, yeah.
And the last quick announcement, uh, this young lady, I know she looks like she's 19, but Celeste has been my wife for 34 years. She is the perfect wife, perfect in every way, the best wife a guy could ever have. Nobody has ever loved anybody as much as I love Celeste. So let's, let's hear from Celeste for putting up with me for 34 years. All right, here we go. Uh, how many of you have uh, heard me uh, speak at the College of Complexes previously? Uh, most of you, many of you. Okay. Jill Stein is the Green Party candidate for president. Here's why you should vote for Jill Stein. Jill Stein is uh, uh, presenting an agenda that uh, the other can't, uh, the other uh, political parties uh, uh, only talk about, but really don't do anything much to accomplish. One of Jill Stein's agendas is to deal with the problem of student debt. A lot of college students and college graduates are buried in debt. Nobody seems to be doing much about it. Jill Stein has uh, a plan for dealing with this. Uh, Congress uh, could come up with uh, a variation of the plan. But the, the issue will be addressed when Jill Stein becomes the next president of the United States. Another issue that Jill Stein wants to address when she becomes president is the issue of mortgages. There are a lot of people who are underwater in their home mortgages. And if you're not familiar with that term, although most of you probably are, underwater means if you bought a, ho a house uh, or uh, a home, whether it's a house, condo, or whatever, uh, if you bought a home for, say, $500,000, and uh, uh, you paid $100,000, you mortgaged $400,000, you owe $400,000, and then with the you know, uh, fiscal situation of the past few years, your house is now worth $300,000 or $325,000. You owe $400,000, your house is worth $325,000. Jill Stein wants to uh, uh, have the federal government address that issue. Jill, again, has her perspective on how it should be handled, and uh, Congress could come up with a variation of that plan. But one way or another, the reason to vote for Jill Stein is to demonstrate that we Americans think that this issue is important enough that uh, should be addressed uh, by Congress on a national basis. The Green Party has always been the party of environmental protection. Uh, uh, we're the party that's opposed to fracking. Uh, we're the party that's opposed to the use of coal because it's a dirty fuel. We're the party that thinks that we should phase out the use of fossil fuels, protect the environment, environmental uh, protection, uh, uh, and uh, uh, minimizing pollution, trying to eliminate pollution to the greatest extent possible. The Green Party also, you'll love this one, the Green Party also is the part is the real party for state church separation. If you look at the Green Party uh, platform, you'll find that the Green Party uh, supports getting rid of what I call the anti-atheist religious graffiti on our money, the God we trust, the anti-atheist religious editorial in the Pledge of Allegiance, the under God phrase. Uh, most of you know that I'm the most prominent atheist in Illinois, and so this is an issue that's important to me. More and more people in this country are coming to recognize that God is made believe, and it, you know, people have a right to a difference of opinion on that issue. We just think that the federal government ought to remain neutral on matters of faith so that everybody can pursue their opinion about religion as they see fit. The Green Party is a party that does not take corporate contributions. So, uh, you know, it, it's all about, as an atheist, I love this one, it's all about the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. The people who contribute the big bucks to the candidates they're the ones that get access to the candidates to talk about what policies they want the legislators or the president to implement so that these big money types and the big money corporations will continue to fund the next campaign of these candidates. The Green Party doesn't take corporate contributions so our allegiance in the Green Party is to the people, not to the big corporations. Let me take a minute to talk to you uh, about 
are candidates for MWRD, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, it used to be known as the Metropolitan Sanitary District. Uh, they, they deal with our wastewater. We have the three most outstanding candidates of all time for MWRD. Uh, uh, there's Dave Ehrlich, Nazrin Khalili, and Karen Rutan. Dave and Nazrin both teach environmental management and sustainability at IIT. They're PhDs. Karen has a long history of environmental activism on the far south side of Chicago, and she also teaches at a Chicago area college. What do the other candidates have? Well, one of them has the daily name, great. You know, how does that qualify him to manage our water? Uh, and uh, uh, the other candidates, you know, maybe they've got political pedigree, but our candidates are real professionals when it comes to dealing with environmental issues. And Nazareth in particular, she has uh, implemented uh, environmental policy uh, in places across the globe. So she's worked on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, wastewater systems in uh, uh, countries in Europe and in Asia and in other places. I don't know any of the, the details, but uh, the bottom line is our candidates know what they're talking about. So I'm asking for your vote for our candidates for MWRD. That would be uh, Dave Ehrlich, Nazrin Khalili, and Karen Rutan. I'm asking for your vote for our candidate for president, Jill Stein, and in particular, I'm asking for those of you who live in, is it the 5th District? To vote for our candidate for Congress, uh, Nancy Wade. Nancy actually has a realistic chance of winning. I am so confident in Nancy's chances of winning, I don't know whether this is true or not, I've asked Nancy, to make sure to set aside two tickets for the inauguration party on January 3rd in Washington. So Celeste and I are going to go out there to, to the victory party. So, oh, oh, and where's the victory party uh, on uh, November 6th? Is it the 6th? That is to be announced. To be announced. Go to the uh, waitingcongress.com or org. Waitingcongress.org website and you can find out where the victory party is going to be held. Uh, so that's my presentation for tonight. Thank you for putting up to me. I, I've spoken at the uh, Buckhouse Square debate, so I'm, I'm accustomed to uh, uh, being nagged and, uh, and, and mocked and attacked uh, 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 by presentation. You certainly are welcome. And as we begin to take questions, and uh, I know you'll be controlling the questions, I promised the gentleman over there uh, the, the first question, and, and you were going to ask something about the, the arrests, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about Jill Stein's arrest and why she was arrested? Okay. Question is, why was Jill Stein arrested, and can I talk about the, uh, her arrest? Uh, uh, Jill has been arrested two times uh, of late, uh, not just once. The most recent one was uh, earlier this week, uh, where uh, Jill engaged in an act of civil disobedience, uh, where uh, she insisted that uh, she and also uh, our vice presidential candidate, uh, whose name is? Sherry Huncala. Sherry Huncala, that's right. You know, we get old, we don't ever get old. Uh, of course, it beats the alternative, but uh, 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 so sometimes, you know, the, 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 uh, being able to retain the names is a little difficult. Anyway, the two of them, they, they were arrested uh, because they uh, attempted to enter, not disrupt, they merely attempted to enter the presidential debate uh, of the two major candidate, uh, uh, the two other major candidate parties, or three major parties, uh, the, the candidates of the other two uh, major parties. Uh, uh, Sherry and uh, Jill wanted to enter, they, they were blocked from entering. Uh, the organization that puts on the debates says that you have to generate 15% in the polls in order to be in the debate. Well, that's sort of reasonable, except for one thing. The news organizations, when they do their polling, they ask, who are you going to vote for, Barack or Mitt? 
They don't ask about you. So how are you going to get the 15 percent? So uh, it's uh, uh, it's a catch-22 type of a situation. Uh, so uh, that's what she was arrested for. She was arrested previously when uh, she attempted to meet with uh, people from uh, Fannie Mae uh, uh, in regards to uh, one of the issues that I mentioned about home mortgages. Uh, they refused to meet with her, so she refused to leave. Uh, the, the two of them refused to leave, so they, they were arrested. And in both situations, they were promptly released. But that's what's going on. Uh, and the, and they were handcuffed to a chair after the arrest for, uh, at the debate. They were each handcuffed to a chair for eight hours without having access to lawyers. So they weren't. The they were that, that I don't know, but apparently, you know, being handcuffed to a chair probably it'd be hard to. So. Yeah. Um, I wish we could do that here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and 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 similar things have happened. So that was with Jill Stein, but um, you know, there is this 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 terrorist that terrorist law that encompasses everything, and and that is how uh, any of us at any time can be arrested and held without access to lawyers, without access to due process, um, and and law enforcement can just claim that they have the right. And, and I don't know if that was actually um, uh, invoked in the situation with Jill and Sherry, but they were definitely handcuffed and left without access to lawyers for eight hours. If it weren't right, right, it would be illegal. It is. There's, there's a question over there, and then Carl, over here, and then we'll go around the room. Carl, uh, here, you're, oh, he, he, I'm yeah. sorry, but oh, I, I am Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. 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 All right, Bob. All right, Bob. I wanted to know if Jill is on the ballot in all 50 states, and if not, what were some of the problems? In order to get on the ballot, you have to meet, uh, you know, it's not just uh, you file one set of nominating petitions and you're on in all 50 states. You have to submit nominating petition papers in each of the 50 states for signatures from that state. So in Illinois, you needed 25,000 signatures. We got 31,000 signatures. Jill is on the ballot here. She, uh, my understanding is she's on the ballot in 35 of the states. Uh, the number may be higher, but how many? 38. Okay, 38 plus the District of Columbia, uh, and uh, did not make the bill in, in the other states. And hey, Mr. Moderator, go ahead. <laughs> Walter. Also. Okay, I, uh, this is for Rob. Uh, I don't understand this stuff about not her not getting 15% of the bill. I, I was told by the newspaper organizations in, in several polls, and each time I asked to, uh, I wanted to tell them I want to vote for somebody other than Obama or Romney, and they said, no, you can't do that. You have to answer one or the other. So how do we get around that? Let, let me tell you what's going on. And uh, my friend, the journalist, might be able to corroborate, but he doesn't want to be part of the story, so probably uh, uh, abstain. Here's what's really going on. Because I, I ran as the Green Party candidate for state representative, in the 53rd district, uh, which is parts of Buffalo Grove, Arlington Heights, Wheeling, Mount Prospect, and Prospect Heights. Here's what's going on. It costs money to cover a candidate. So if they start covering third party candidates, it's going to cost them more money. So they pretend that the only candidates who, are, uh, who merit coverage are the candidates of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. They refuse to give us the time of day. They refuse to give us coverage because then if they do, then they have to cover our campaign, our campaign and they have to go where we go and follow what we're doing. They don't want to spend the money. And the, the journalism, the field of journalism, is, uh, is definitely struggling financially, so they're looking to limit their costs whenever and wherever they can. Do you have anything to add to that? Or are you the moderator? All right. Uh, Walter, pick up? Yeah, well, I just wanted to add to that that we actually did. Is this a question? Oh, no, I guess not. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a question. Oh, I just want to add that we actually did have inclusive debates. In 1980, we, we had the debates up to that point had been sponsored by the yeah. League of Women Voters. 
with a with a with just you know, not an onerous criteria, but very um, inclusive criteria in in, you know, in in entering these debates. And I think the last one was between John John B. Anderson, Reagan, and Carter. And after that, um, the party uh, John B. Anderson he got a lot of coverage. You know, he got his his numbers moved up in the polls, and um, so all of a sudden the Republicans and Democrats were thinking. I don't think so. I don't think this is a good situation for us. So what they did is they they handed the League of Women Voters, both parties, a set of terms. They said to the League of Women Voters, you must do this, this, and this, or we'll not participate. And the League said, we will wash our hands of it. We will have none of this. So the Democrats and Republicans, they formed uh, this corporation called the Commission on Presidential Debates, which is a private entity that um, had, is rigged with both two parties that set up a member, memorandum of understanding, which is all public, you can uh, Google that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a rigged system. You can't get 15% if you're not polled. So it's, it's, a vicious, it's a vicious cycle. How can you get 15% if you're not mentioned in the media? So it's, it's a vicious cycle. Um, is it a vicious cycle? I don't know. You? And do the candidates, Mr. Sherman, do you agree with Mr. Pickups? The last thing Walter said was you can't get coverage if you don't uh, get in the media. Well, that's one of the reasons why uh, Jill chose as a, uh, a political strategy, political tactic is the right phrase, uh, to get herself arrested for not being allowed in because that got her the uh, coverage and then people will find out about her candidacy and uh, uh, learn more about the candidacy. Uh, Dave Zucker. Yes, my question, Rat, is what is the position of both the Green Party and Jill Stein on continued support both diplomatic and financial for Israel? Shalom, Dave. Uh, I don't know. Uh, from my own personal perspective, and, and since Nancy will be in Congress and, and be involved in foreign policy, I'm sure Nancy would be a good person to respond to the question. Uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, throughout history, and particularly from the last century, there has been tremendous oppression uh, of uh, Jewish people, that uh, they are in that part of the world uh, so that uh, they can uh, uh, live their lives as they see fit uh, uh, with a little bit of religious freedom. But it's a very complex situation. There's also the state church uh, separation issue. Should uh, American taxpayers, to what extent should American taxpayers be subsidizing uh, a state that is identified uh, with a particular theological perspective? Uh, but Nancy's going to be uh, in Congress. She'll be voting on uh, national policy pertaining to this issue. Why don't you answer? Um, there does need to be a two-state solution, and a great deal of the attention that we pay to that part of the world, the entire Middle East, has to do with our dependence on fossil fuels and with our, our military support for fossil fuel interests. When the, the, it puts an undue amount of pressure on uh, that particular part of the world. And by withdrawing support for fossil fuel interests and stopping the wars for fossil fuel interests, that will uh, enable us to cut back on the on the pressure, uh, the, the un, undue amount of pressure, and and come up with better solutions, a two-state solution. I all laser. There's not a single goal that any one of you uh, read, uh, spoke about that uh, I can't wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, there are other people like you, Nancy, who started with the pure green heart and passion and fire. Something happens when people like you get to uh, Washington, D.C., to the Congress, um, what, do you have any ideas, any plans as to how to revise the structure of Congress so that people would not, so goals that are very clean and good would not get displaced and become just tools in the service of the people who occupy the chairs? 
We need 535 members of Congress who are members of the Green Party. But Nancy, you might want to. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree with that. Um, but yet, I did talk about getting the big money out of politics. Uh, we should, we do need to get the, the Constitution amended. Uh, I am active in something called Move to Amend. There's, there's a number of organizations who are moving in this direction. I'm active with Move to Amend, uh, which is trying to get the Constitution amended to say that corporations are not people and that money is not speech, it is property. And um, the Move to Amend uh, is responsible in Chicago for getting a non-binding resolution onto our ballots for November 6th. Now it is, it is, it doesn't have the, the force of law, it is a, a, essentially an opinion, but we can all vote in favor of that to start the process uh, here in Illinois. Um, the, the corrupting influence is the money. That's what it is. So we should have across the board publicly financed elections and, and get the big money out of politics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wes Weiger? Uh, how uh, are you going to successfully address the problem that most of the 99% aren't even aware of your candidacies? Yep, it's an obstacle, but the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And that's why I decided to run for office. And, uh, as my, my candidacy makes the Green Party stronger here in Chicago, in Illinois, and supporting me makes the Green Party stronger. Um, there are many, many movements that we all are familiar with, that we all could name, the women's movement, the civil rights movement. It started with people getting together and deciding they were going to do something. And that's where we have to start, that's where I'm starting, and that's where we have to jump off from. Rob, the chairman has a response. One of my jobs as the chairman of the Cook County Green Party is to address that issue, and here's how that issue is being addressed. We have a multifaceted effort uh, to address that issue. One of the ways that we're dealing with it is by getting uh, uh, members of the Green Party <coughs> to uh, run for local office school board, uh, city council, village board, but also to get involved even before that in things like uh, the plan commission, the zoning board, get some experience in government there, then run for city council, village board, school board, those types of offices, then run for Congress or for uh, uh, the Illinois legislature and, and for uh, constitutional officers, things like an Illinois governor or uh, state uh, 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 Attorney General, Secretary of State. So it's a process of getting involved in politics, getting yourself known <coughs> as a competent and honorable person who uh, puts the people first <coughs> rather than their campaign, campaign contributors first. And then once you demonstrate uh, the quality of your public service, then you move up and people recognize, oh, Green Party candidates, they do right by the people. We want more members of the Green Party to serve an elective office. So it's a process of uh, starting at the bottom, building it up, and expanding. Pat Butler? Yeah, I, uh, I guess you, first off, uh, full disclosure, I also am a uh, newspaper reporter. Uh, I guess you could call me a member of the compassionately pragmatic school of the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's this uh, that occurs to me. Nancy, virtually every one of the points that you cited were points that had been made and implemented or attempted to be implemented at one time or another by either the Democratic Party or in some of the cases regarding conservation the Republican Party under Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, have you, uh, and Teddy Roosevelt's ideas live today. We owe a great yeah. deal for him. We ought to have a program on him sometime. But anyway, uh, have you given some thought, has the party given some thought to forming some kind of uh, working relationship, an alliance, if you will, 
with both the Democratic Party and the labor movement. The history of political parties in this country has very often been seemingly fringe groups have entered into mainstream parties and eventually became the dominant voice of that party. Have you given some thought to going that route? Don't do it! <laughs> So, this is, this is a, a, a perspective, my perspective on the Democratic Party. And, and, uh, we as progressives have been in an abusive relationship with the Democratic Party for too long. What happens in an abusive relationship? Your abuser makes promises to you, and then abuses you, and begs you to come back. Vote for me again. Vote for me again. I won't do it again. And then your abuser lies to you again. And then you go back. And the cycle repeats itself. What do you do if you're in an abusive relationship? You leave it. You leave it. And that is what we as progressives have to do in regards to the Democratic Party. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, and if you can kill it. the abuser, shoot him and kill him. Crucify him. I represent him twice. One was uh, as, uh, uh, in the Democratic Party, and then I realized hey, I'm in the wrong party. Then I ran uh, as a candidate as nominee of the Green Party. Uh, one of the questions that CNN radio guy asked me about uh, pertaining to this, he says, what happens when uh, the uh, other two major parties uh, uh, take on your agenda? What, what was the, the word that you used, uh, the phrase? Uh -huh. uh, that's right. What happens when the other two parties appropriate your agenda? Because when I ran as a Green Party candidate, uh, a number of my ideas, my opponents, appropriated and they said okay we're for that too and then those ideas get implemented by the government so from my perspective it the most important thing is that our progressive agenda whether it's in regards to the environment or other issues get implemented as public policy and if what it takes is for the other parties to appropriate our agenda and uh, implement those ideas, that's fine with me as long as those ideas get uh, uh, get implemented into law. But this demonstrates why it's important to support the Green Party and maybe become a member of the Green Party because then we can put forward this progressive agenda for the rest of the, wa of the world, the rest of this country, and the rest of the state to appropriate and implement into law doesn't matter who gets credit for it as long as it gets enacted into law. All right. Tim, you did get a question. Did I? You? No. no. All right. Tim. All right. I'd like to know your views on um, energy policy. Specifically, I know you're opposed to coal. I know you're opposed to fossil fuels. Right. What do you propose as a viable alternative? And if you could comment or if you know anything about it, tell us your views on thorium. One of the uh, uh, main planks of the Jill Stein campaign is a green energy policy to get rid of fossil fuels uh, and to go with renewables. So the, the issue is renewable fuels, whether that's wind, solar, or any other means of renewable energy. That's the key, renewable energy. Uh, thorium. Uh, I don't know what you want me to tell you in regards to thorium. Thorium is something that uh, you know people uh, used uh, 50, 75 years ago, and uh, you know we're trying to mitigate uh, the, those problems that, and clean up uh, the mess that was left by uh, previous generations. Nancy, uh, well, I definitely um, agree with the Green Party platform on on energy, and I'm saying that we need a national environmental defense policy on energy, on, on the climate. That is the level to which we must elevate our concern uh, to get the dialogue going throughout the country and, and, and to the same level as, well, actually more so, the, the 
getting to the moon program that Kennedy proposed. Our, our, the, the presidential candidate, as Jill Stein does, should be moving the, the environment to the very top of the list of priorities, not somewhere buried in, in uh, the rest of the priorities. Let's see. Wes, One of the things that our MWRD candidates uh, have been emphasizing is they want to have less rainwater going into the sewer system and using less water in your homes. And there's technology to do that and strategy for doing all those things. So yet another reason to well, uh, vote for our MWRD candidates. Go ahead. All right. Uh, yes, Conrad, uh, why is there should be Two years ago, some of us who were working hard for the Green Party candidate in the were distressed when he made a big issue out of uh, claiming that uh, Harry Truman should have been uh, jailed as a war criminal. Uh, we wonder whether uh, he was speaking for the Green Party or from the first story and what role, if any, he is playing as a uh, uh, that might be something that, that I might be better uh, at, at him, uh, and, and Walter knows all about this. Uh, was he speaking for the party or for himself personally? He was definitely speaking for himself personally for this reason. Uh, as chairman of the Cook County Green Party, in order for a position to be advanced as the position of the Green Party, it requires a meeting. The issue needs to be presented at a meeting of the coordinating council or the executive committee or some some group, but I'm not, not an expert on all different groups. But it has to be presented there, it has to be approved, and then uh, somebody like me would say, okay, this is the uh, position that has been approved. So the thing about, what was it Truman, did you say? Uh, the thing about Truman, that had never gone before uh, one of our committees. So it had nothing to do with his campaign. Uh, th that's right. And, uh, you know, he's a candidate and can say what he wants, but that doesn't mean that that's the position of the Green Party. And I want to assure you that was not the position of the Green Party. That was his personal position and, and only his personal position. Did you want to add? And he's not involved in my campaign whatsoever. Hey, Andy uh, Anderson and then Russell Johnson. Whenever you talk to people, I assume from the list of what you told us tonight on these issues, probably 95% of all Americans with an income of under $100,000 would support you and vote for you in a heartbeat if they yeah. knew, if they knew yeah. that you even existed. We only have one progressive station in Chicago where you can hear anything like this. It's called WCPT. What, what, do you have any kind of plan for using other media telling people how they can uh, combat the deluge of uh, mythology they get from mainstream media? That's why we're here tonight. We're telling you. We want you to tell your friends and neighbors and relatives. We, we talk to the press, we tell them the, the, that who we are, but uh, you know, it's a struggle to get the press to take us seriously and to be willing to spend money. It's more a financial thing. Yeah, you, you missed my point. My, my question is, you, you keep talking to the mainstream press and they keep whacking you out. ABC, NBC, CBS. Well, we have they a are running an intentional coordinated right. blackout That's because true. they know the public would vote for you in a heartbeat. That's so right. my question is, do you, do you have any kind of game plan to develop other media, like specific websites? It, it's to build the party, build the organization, and, and get our members. It can't be just word of mind. Well, we're, we're, trying, we're trying all the different uh, techniques of talking to progressive press. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a process, but uh, it, it takes time. As it stands, it can come in My website is www.wadeincongress.org. So we do have a website up. We have a Facebook uh, page as well. It is Nancy Wade in Congress. Um, we are uh, going door to door. Um, dropping literature, talking to people, that is the face-to-face -face kind of thing. Uh, we are purchasing robocalls. I know that robocalls are not always everyone's favorite thing, but they are uh, less Ooh. expensive than, than uh, uh, media buys, and we have to conserve our resources. 
Um, and, if, and once again, that name was WadeInCongress.org. If you want to contribute, we can help get the word out. Uh, but we are purchasing robocalls that will go to Democratic voters and, of course, Green voters in the 5th District. Um, there, there, there's no magic about, there's no magic way. I mean, I've thought about getting arrested, but my husband is not in favor of that idea. Uh, but it might bring some media. So, you know, maybe uh, uh, th there's a, a, some appropriate occasion. But that's an extreme thing. A candidate shouldn't have to get arrested to get media. Have you considered working with some of the Hollywood actors and actresses? Uh, one question to follow up to that. Uh, sorry. Uh, Russell. What's your position on the Keystone Pipeline and that all our oil right now is coming to Canada <coughs> as the Canadian tar sand, which is probably the only, the only alternative right now to uh, Middle East oil? Um, the the um, Keystone Pipeline should not be built. Period. But there were already is a pipeline that's sending the same oil to us that we're reusing right now. The, the Keystone Pipeline will be will be sending oil overseas. It won't even be sending oil to us. It will go all the way across our country south but, and be shipping the oil overseas. So we are already producing enough <coughs> conventional fossil fuels in this country to be taking care of our needs right now. I know that. That's... We could, but we're, we're, too many interests are stopping that. Uh, Mary Abram. Yes, I was wondering, you know, if you were familiar with Can TV, they have certain stations, and if you, if you um, make something like a film and put them on, they'll, they'll be very happy to help you put them on there. Okay. Thanks for the, you all for the hear tip. The I appreciate that. <laughs> Can TV. Questions in regards to getting on CAN TV. And it does, yeah, that, it does that we uh, into, reach, reach a lot of people. I didn't hear you. I said it does reach a lot of people. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anybody else? All right. Uh, Janet Miller. Um, what is your opinion on uh, ballot access for minority parties? The, the ballot access, uh, the, the war on ballot access that the Republicans are waging is being portrayed as a partisan issue in the media. It is a demo democracy, democratic with a small d issue. Do we have a democracy or don't we? And if we value democracy, then we need to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. Now, some of the some of the issues that I, I, in the interest of time, that I didn't bring up in my presentation, as my position, for instance, on on uh, gay marriage, on marriage for LGBT people. I think everyone should be able to get married if that is what they want to do, and they should have the same rights. Our Constitution says that the people have the rights of the in the Constitution. LGBT people are people, and therefore should have the same constitutional rights. Uh, on a woman's right to choose, women must be able to control our own bodies, period. That's it. So those, those are, those are uh, issues that have gotten a lot of play in the media, and those are my discussions on those particular issues. Uh, Rob? In regards to ballot access, I have personally been to Springfield on a number of occasions on the matter of ballot access. The number of nominating petition signatures that people are required to get are outrageous. They, they are preposterously high. The whole purpose is to try to keep non-incumbents from getting on the ballot. So many times, you only have one candidate, the incumbent, on the ballot. Uh, the uh, uh, requirements are way too high, uh, and that uh, what you end up with uh, is not uh, people signing nominating petitions as an endorsement of the candidate who's running, but rather saying, well, anybody should be able to get on the ballot, so they just sign, they don't know who the candidate, let me assure you, when I circulated my own nominating petitions, even though, you know, in this room, I, you know, people know who I am, I'm well known here in this room, 
but out there in Buffalo Grove uh, and uh, uh, places out there when I ran, most of the people who signed my petition, they had no idea who I am. They didn't know what my position was on the issues. Uh, you also run into a situation where, uh, uh, for uh, like when Jill Stein was running for uh, uh, for president, uh, she uh, uh, the the campaign we hired mercenaries the best way to, to put it the people who who are on a stipend based on how many signatures they get so you end up with people who could care less who don't know who the candidate is could care less who the candidate is getting signatures for people who don't know the candidate uh, who the candidate is or what their position is and, and, and it's just a preposterous situation so we need to have a reasonable number of nominate petition signatures to demonstrate that there is support in the community for this person to be on the ballot. But you don't want to have something like 25,000 signatures for Jill Stein to get on the ballot because after a thousand signatures or so, you know, it's just wasting time, wasting money. Yes. Uh, what do you think that situation you just described? Did you say what do I propose? What do you propose to fix the situation? Legislation that reduces. See, the, the number of signatures which are required in order to get on the ballot is set by the Illinois General Assembly, whether it's your federal office in Illinois or state and local office in Illinois. So that's why I've been going to Springfield, meeting with the elections committee, looking for sponsors of a bill to lower the number of signatures that you need. Uh, when I ran for state rep, uh, uh, they wanted the, uh, something like 600 signatures. I, I think uh, Nancy needed uh, something like 5,000 signatures in, in the 5th District. That's ridiculous. You don't need 5,000 signatures. Get on the ballot. People will find out who you are, what you stand for. So I'm trying to get uh, the General Assembly to lower that number. The problem is the laws are made by people in the General Assembly, by the incumbents, they don't want competition. They don't want somebody to run against them. So they keep the number high because here's exactly why they keep the number high. The elected officials, they have their staff. They have their employees or government employees. Well, if these government employees want to keep their jobs after the election, which you do if you're uh, uh, elected uh, uh, representative keeps his job, well, then you better get out there <laughs> and circulate nominating petition papers for that guy to get him on the ballot again, and then he's the only one on the ballot. Nancy, any comment? So it's, it's very interesting that the the, uh, the legal term established parties uh, they they need five percent of the vote in the district the in the, for the last election to get established party status. They still need signatures of registered voters to put their candidates on the ballot. They need 600 signatures. A new party, such as what was our status, needs 5,000. But what's interesting to me is that um, it's something that could potentially backfire because we submitted 9,000 signatures. That means we talked to 9,000 people. And many, many of those people said to me, because I was one of the people getting the signatures, uh, a Green Party candidate. I wasn't going to vote this time, but now that I know there's going to be a Green Party candidate on the ballot, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote for you. So by forcing a new party to get out there and talk personally to thousands and thousands of people, that could actually backfire. I hope so. Bernie? Yes, uh, three quick questions, if I may. Three. Three. Yeah, one. 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 Uh, pertaining to local judges, do you feel that it's appropriate that they're elected, or do you think we might be better off if they were appointed, perhaps for longer terms? And when you're done with those two, I'll get to the last one. In regards to well, your first question, the Green Party has long had a, uh, stood for the proposition of uh, instant uh, runoff elections. 
Uh, I personally am, am opposed to that, but I'm in the minority within the Green Party. Most people in the Green Party support it. I subscribe to the notion, hey, whoever gets the most votes wins. You don't do a runoff. That's whoever gets the most votes wins. In regards to well, uh, the second thing, uh, the, the judge's question, I mean, this is insane. This is crazy. This is idiotic. This is stupid. Let me tell you how I really feel about it, about the situation. I mean, we don't know who these judges are. We have no way of knowing. You know, you see the name, you know, some guy named Murphy is running. Some guy named uh, Schwartz is running. Oh, I'm Jewish. I'm going to vote for Rosenblum. Oh, I'm Irish. I'm going to vote for Murphy. I mean, that's how people are making these decisions. They have absolutely... Absolutely no idea what their judicial temperament is, whether they're liberal, conservative, what they stand for. Uh, it's just insane. It should be replaced. The system should be replaced by uh, appointed judges. And here's how you get rid of this system. Every election, we have people running, we have judges running for retention. I always vote no on retaining the judges because if we get rid of this stupid idiotic system maybe then we'll get judges who are appointed based on, on their qualifications rather than just getting a vote because people don't know who they are voting based on, on the, uh, their party or, or their the, the, the ethnicity of their last name that sort of thing. Walter did you want to add something? No. Uh, Nancy. All right. Um, you had a follow-up uh, problem. Gary Carnati, you, you asked your yes, uh, I'll be very quick about this. In terms of conserving energy with existing resources, do you think there's any use that can be made of the hot air emanating from the current crop of political gas bags? <laughs> <laughs> Present party is accepted, right? Uh, <laughs> well, Bob Matters. Uh, you can inform us of what the trend has been in Green Party uh, fundraising. What what kind of money have they raised ever since, let's say, Ralph Nader? I remember I went to the big super rally in 2000. And, uh, I'll tell you later. I, everybody was real optimistic about the emergence of a, th of a third party. Then it kind of fizzled out. So I'm just wondering, like, what kind of membership numbers are there nationally? Or, or more importantly, what kind of money is coming in year, year to year? Uh, Ralph Nader right now is a non-factor. Ralph Nader, uh, that was something that happened uh, previously. And uh, people are uh, making their donations or contributions based on what's happening now. Uh, the best thing that we're doing in regards to donations is instead of trying to get uh, as many candidates as we possibly can onto the ballot, we're trying to get the best candidates. So if you look around at our MWRD candidates, our candidates, for Congress, a candidate for president, we have the best candidates, and and that's why you know, somebody like Nancy is able to raise the thousands and thousands of dollars that she has. Right, Ellen uh, Perot. Nancy, I just wanted to pitch uh, a fundraiser at Democracy Burlesque on Tuesday. It's a fun fundraiser, and if you mention the Wade in Congress campaign at the door. They contribute four dollars of the admission price to the campaign. Oh, really? At Mary's Attic on Clark. I don't remember the exact address, but um, it'd be. Uh, I think maybe Walt is going to come up with it for us. Fifty four hundred North Clark. So yeah, it's at uh, 5400 North Clark. Uh, it starts at 715. You can purchase pit tickets online at Democracy Burlesque. Make sure you choose the show on the 23rd because it's every Tuesday that this. This um, the troop, uh, my economy troop comes up and donate part of the proceeds uh, if you mention that cause. Uh, so uh, the Tuesday, next Tuesday will be our night. So. All right, Ella. Okay. Um, this is for the Jill Stein representative. Um, how do you propose getting a handle on, on the debt? Um, you know, do you plan on dealing with entitlements, or what do you plan on doing? Because like, it's a serious problem. I happen to, I personally happen to uh, agree with uh, uh, the Republicans when they say we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. We have to stop spending so much money, we have to stop spending money that we're not taking in. Uh, uh, 
it, it's just insane the way that the uh, Barack has spent, uh, has run up a trillion dollars in additional debt, uh, at least a trillion dollars in additional debt in each year that he has been president. Uh, you know, the, the Republicans are not a solution. The uh, Democrats are not a solution. The solution is put Green Party people in, and instead of uh, spending all of our money on, on wars and on financing Wall Street, we'll put mo the, the people's money into well, going to bat for the people. And I'm sure Nancy has a comment on that. We're spending the money in the wrong places, uh, chief among it being the unfunded wars. Trillions and trillions of dollars in treasure and, in, and uh, many, many lives lost in unfunded wars. As I mentioned before, societies that put a majority of their resources into the military historically have gone bankrupt, and that is where we're headed. So the priorities are wrong. There, there's no, money available. We need to close the offshore tax havens. We need to uh, have fairness in taxation, meaning the wealthiest among us need to be paying their fair share. We need to have a Wall Street transaction tax. Uh, so there's many ways to fund what we need to have, what we, uh, which is programs for people. We need to preserve Social Security. We need to have Medicare for all. We need to have universal health insurance. So those are the things that we should be supporting not wars for fossil fuel interests, and not subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, among many other things. Okay, Ernie Norman? Okay, uh, how do you feel about term limits? However, Rob, I want to address what you just said. You said it's, it's a spending problem, problem, not a revenue problem, and I believe uh, I would say it's a revenue said, problem. Yes, that we should Except be getting, for the spending on military. Uh, taxes back up to the 1981 rates, which were like 70% of the top rate. On the very top. Okay, that, uh, could you address yeah, those two issues? What, what's the question then? Uh, okay, I just, well, I think you probably answered it. We do believe it's a revenue problem. We do need to increase taxes in certain areas to increase the revenue. <coughs> uh, term limits, how do you feel about term limits? The term limits, a uh, two-part answer. Number one, that's why we have elections. But uh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so that that should solve the problem, but it hasn't been solving the problem because of the power of incumbency. So it's what I've learned over the years is that there are plenty of outstanding people who can serve the public. We don't need to have people uh, becoming lifetime politicians that, uh, uh, so, so, so I've, I, I'm on both sides of this, this issue here. Uh, the, what's going to happen is uh, the only way to get term limits is if incumbents vote in favor of it. They're never going to do that, not in Illinois. So don't hold your breath waiting for term limits to become the law of land. It ain't going to happen. I am in favor of term limits. Um, it, that is a, a, a hard throw to hoe, but then so are a lot of the things that we're proposing. Yes, uh, Andy? I have a question that nobody has asked. Um, do you have, uh, does the Green Party have any kind of concept about addressing the criminal activity of previous yes. office holders? Or like, you know, Nobody from the Wall Street banking open criminal enterprises been prosecuted yet. What would the Green Party do about the criminal activity of Wall Street that brought us into this depression? Uh, let me throw you a curve and then we'll, we'll get Nancy's perspective on this. I want to do something about the criminal activity that is currently taking place with our public officials. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Every year, the state of Illinois passes a capital bill, an infrastructure bill, about 1,600 pages long. And the, every year there are tens of millions of dollars in unconstitutional, blatantly unconstitutional appropriations, particularly to religious organizations, houses of worship, parochial schools, religious ministries. But it's not just that they include appropriations to religious organizations, 
what our legislators do is they include appropriations to the religious organizations that are run by that particular legislator. So you have state senator um, uh, from uh, uh, Salem uh, uh, Baptist Church, uh, 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 James Meeks, that's the guy. Uh, James Meeks sponsored uh, a grant of $20,000 to Salem Christian Academy. Well, who's the C CEO of Salem Christian Academy? James Meeks. Uh, LaShawn Ford. Uh, black state rep on the west side of Chicago sponsored a grant of $500,000 to build a new parochial school for Christ the King Jesuit College Prep School uh, and like the 5100 block of West uh, Jackson or West Washington something like that over there and did I mention that uh, LaShawn Ford is on the Board of Trustees of Christ the King Jesuit College Prep and the most outrageous one of them all, and I'll turn it over to Nancy for, for uh, her 15 seconds. Or <laughs> not take as long as he wants, that's humor. The most outrageous one of them all. Uh, General David will like this one. Uh, David, he, the, the question was in, in regards to uh, uh, unconstitutional expenditures. There was a grant of $150,000 sponsored by. State Senator Ira Silverstein to the Camp Shy program. How many of you are familiar with Camp Shy? A few of you are. You know, people from my neighborhood are familiar with the Camp Shy program. Camp Shy is uh, uh, an overnight camp for boys and girls between the ages of 9 and 16 run by the Jewish Federation of Chicago. And ladies and gentlemen, do you know where Camp Shy is located? It's in the Wisconsin Dells! What the hell are, are we doing to spending our Illinois tax dollars to upgrade the infrastructure and a religious ministry in Wisconsin? But Ira, we're all on a first name basis, uh, Rock and me and Ira and me and, and uh, Pat Quinn and me. Ira used to be the director uh, of the Bernard Horwich J, the, the Jewish Community Center on Tui Avenue, part of the Jewish Federation of Chicago. So what goes on here, what's really going on here is these large religious organizations gets one of their directors or or one of the yeah, one of the members of the board of directors or or, one, uh, or the reverend, the, the head of their church gets them elected to uh, uh, the, the General Assembly because, you know, if you have a, a, a shul with a uh, thousand members or a church with five thousand members, then all the members vote, you get to, to Springfield, and what do you do? You sponsor grants to your church or your parochial school or your religious ministry. It's crazy. And one more quick thing. You'll love this one. I just filed a brief last month at the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, challenging a decision by the Seventh Circuit, the Appellate Court in Chicago, in which I challenged a $20,000 grant by the state of Illinois to rebuild a 110-foot-high Christian cross in southwestern Illinois called the Ball Knob Cross. And I say, the hell is this? We're not paying taxes to rebuild a Christian cross on private property, and we're going to the Supreme Court because the appellate court said, based on Supreme Court precedent, the, dis the, cons the decision on constitutionality is based <coughs> on which branch of government makes the expenditure. Well, if it's the legislative branch, then it's unconstitutional. But if the same grant is made by the executive branch, uh, you know, Pat Quinn, the, the governor, you know, the Department of, in this case, Commerce and Economic Opportunity, then it is constitutional. So I've asked the Supreme Court to decide should the constitutionality of an expenditure of public funds be based on uh, which branch of government spends the money or on how the money is spent by government. And now here's my friend Nancy. Just be kidding. Congress lady, the woman to be. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh. Thanks. Uh, the American people were robbed. Just as if we had been held up at gunpoint on, on a corner in Chicago. Uh, my family, as an example, of the college educations that we had saved for for our children fell in the crash. Our, our retirement fund fell. The value of our home fell. The value of another building that we could not sell because of the crash fell and ultimately had to be sold in a short sale. If we had been robbed at gunpoint, 
of $200,000 on the street corner, somebody, if they were caught, would go to jail. No one has gone to jail. Why? Well, the incumbent, for an example, takes money from Goldman Sachs. Why would he want to prosecute anybody at Goldman Sachs? That's another good argument for Green Party candidates. Yeah. We wouldn't do that. Okay. Stuff. Okay. Now, can I get a second uh, question? Let's see. Everybody who has their hand up has had a question before. We will begin with, yes, Walter. Um, this has just come up in conversation with someone sitting near me. Uh, I worked for government all of my life. I worked hard and I did my very best. What you do? I'm well qualified for what I did. What did and everybody do? here at my table did the same thing. But Rahm Emanuel, a Democrat, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, a Democrat, Mike Madigan, a Democrat, and Governor Quinn, a Democrat, are trying to take our pensions away that we've already worked for. We don't get a do back on our youth. And uh, I believe Obama, from the way his, his top economic advisors are talking, has made commitments to uh, international uh, uh, money lenders, uh, such as the Monetary Fund, to implement some form of uh, austerity here in the United States, which, I, which is essentially what's happening to us. We're losing our pensions. Uh, and I'm being told I should vote for the Democrats because of this, or in spite of it. And there's not you heard me talk about the abusive relationship? Time yeah. to leave them. Time to leave them. <coughs> Jill Stein has made this a major issue. You earned your pension. You deserve your pension. Jill Stein was out here uh, walking the picket lines uh, with the Chicago's Teacher Union at the Lane Tech High School, was it? Uh, where? Lane Tech. Yeah, at Lane Tech. That was Nancy. Were you there too, yeah. Nancy? Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, this is something where the Green Party is very pro-labor. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We are the real pro-labor party, not the Democrats. Vote for the Green Party candidates. Okay. Yeah, um, and I address this to uh, both speakers. Uh, you're basically talking about having a uh, multiple party system like uh, they do have in a number of other advanced countries such as Ireland, Great Britain, Australia, Canada, Germany. It's called a multi-party coalition. Right. Okay. Uh, how many, how many oh, signatures yeah. are required for a party to get on the national ballot Let's say in Great Britain, for example, or let's say in uh, Canada. Is this about an election in Great Britain or Canada? No, it's about comparing. It's about comparing requirements in other. Aren't you the guy that said you told somebody, to somebody to move out of this country? You told somebody to move out of this country. Would you close your mouth and keep your ears open long enough to hear the whole statement? You might agree with it. Hurry up. <laughs> I want to be president of Lithuania. How many signatures? So my understanding is your question is uh, uh, how many uh, uh, nominating petition signatures are required in other countries? Okay. I, I, I'm an American. I have no idea, but I have a friend named Walter who knows all about this stuff apparently. So um, just a side, like side voting systems and international politics of sort of how do you mind? Um, in places like Canada. In places like Germany and places like the UK, you simply have to file uh, a fee. That's it. Just a filing fee, just to get data on the ballot. Versus here, where we have 51 different rules on how to get on the ballot. It, it's insane. In places like Canada, if you run for office and you get a certain percentage of the vote, you get, it's, I think it's 500 actually to, uh, to run for uh, in a writing at the federal level. If you get a certain vote, you get some of that that money refunded to you. So um, I say to people who say, "Well, you know, we we can't have a parliament system. We can't have a different voting system." Well, guess what, folks? Other countries have different voting systems, and it works there. Why do we have seven kinds of brands of cereal, but we only have two parties? It's insane. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Well, let's go to let's go to let's go to rebuttals. Yeah. One last question. One last question. Yeah. Do, do you think federal employees deserve an increase in pay and benefits? That's a tough so. Federal employees deserve an increase in pay and benefits. Uh, I'd like to tell you the answer is yes, but the real answer is I don't know how much they're getting paid. I don't know what their benefits are, they so might. I don't have my word for it. It's but, not but enough. Nancy's going to be voting on that issue, so I'm sure Nancy's an expert on this. No, that's all right. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks, Laura. Thanks. Um, you know, the, I, I would uh, concur with Rob in that, no, I actually don't know what every single federal employee makes. But I do know that they're vitally important to our economy, and they're vitally important to our country, and we should not be making, that is not where we should be looking for cuts. Yeah. That is not where we should be looking for cuts. Yes, that's right. As far as an increase, I have to study that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. Um, but vitally important for us, absolutely, vitally important. Ellen Haro. Okay, um, I'm wondering if we have publicly financed election, how would they decide which candidate is deserving of the money for the public financing? Nancy, you ought to go first. Well, I, I, I don't have the, at the tip of my fingers everything that the Fair Elections Act proposes, but there is such a thing called the Fair Elections Act that addresses that very specifically. Um, and the, 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 the bottom line is that a candidate has to show a certain reasonable level of support in donations, and then that candidate gets um, matching funds. But the, but the other side of it is, the elections are completely publicly financed, so that the playing field truly is much more level. Um, and for, as, as far as more particulars, the Fair Elections Act is You're what to look at. You're saying the candidates can't use their own funds? And it, would, it would be, uh, Connecticut right now has completely publicly financed elections. There is no... There is no other, uh, they, they have, the candidates do have, um, as I understand it, they do have their own uh, fundraising, but there, there's also, if I have this correct, there is a lid on how much they can themselves contribute, and the rest is, uh, is, is matched. My understanding is that Jill Stein is a strong proponent of public funding of uh, elections. Do you guys know anything about that? Is, that? is that an accurate statement that Jill Stein is a proponent of, of public funding of elections? I personally am strongly opposed to it. I think it's a blatant violation of my First Amendment rights. When I pay taxes, it's not to pay for the political speech of my political opponents. I think that uh, if you're a candidate for office, you ought to persuade people to uh, support your candidacy. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, limits as to how much uh, somebody can, can contribute and to, to limit it to only real persons, not corporation persons. But uh, so th there's a, a diversity of viewpoints on this uh, matter in the Green Party. All right. The last question goes to Wes Wagger, who comes here with Green Party literature faithfully. Uh, Wes, what do you view as the worst error of the current congressman? I'm sorry. What's the worst? The question is, what do you regard as the worst error by yep, uh, uh, the congressman? Uh, I'm trying to blank out. That's okay. Mike would have to remember his name. Yeah, not every November 6th, right? Well, his, uh, uh, currently, his vote to support the, the FISA Act, which allows to extend it for the next five years, which allows warrantless uh, surveillance on all of us. Uh, there's there's ways to fix that act that would protect our, our civil liberties, uh, most uh, prominent among them, making sure that there has to be a warrant in order to, to wiretap or survey someone. Uh, he voted for it. He didn't attempt to fix it. He just said, yeah, go ahead. You know, the Constitution be <coughs> I'm on board for that. Is 
that a recent vote? Yeah, that's within the last few weeks. And do we hear about it in the media? No. That's the question. No. Let's go to rebuttals. Let's go to rebuttals. Let's go to rebuttals, Brom. It's time for the rebuttals. Yeah. 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 Chair, I'd like to ask Celeste if she has a question for any of us. For either of us. Oh, no. Okay. <sighs> All right. In that case, uh, how many people here? How about a hand for the speaker? How about a hand for the speaker? <laughs> Five minutes. Uh, how many have <laughs> remarks to make for the rest of us? For our enlightenment or whatever. An hour apiece. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. All right. Um, four minutes. Uh, Let's get started. You're then. going to have to three point six. Uh, that's a maximum of, of four minutes. Four minutes, Brom. Have to be all right. Let's go. <coughs> four minutes, Frank. That's it. So, all right. I don't have to tell you that in the last few months I have becoming more and more despondent of what is going on. Uh, we, society, have re reached a wall that we have to confront. And the wall is that we are uh, increasing the rate at which we are depleting the earth of, of all the resources. We are uh, contaminating the water, the aquifers, the surface water. Um, by throwing 4,500 tons of plastic shit on the, pla on the, on the sea every day, a billion tons a year, year after year after year, we are changing not only the temperature of the sea, the composition, the acidity, the chemistry of the sea, we are changing the fauna of the sea because of these plastics de deteriorate or decay into biologically active uh, ingredients. Um, and uh, we are going uh, like down in a train down the hill without brakes. And, and we are discussing, you know, how we vote, who we vote for, and all that. And I think the Green Party that have a somehow better view of what we have to do. But in spite of that, we don't, in, we don't incite people to really see the magnitude of the problem that we are confronting. Uh, most of the thinkers, scientists, uh, uh, Hansen and, and, and NASA and others, they are telling us we, have, we are missing the time to act. We are passing the point of no return. The uh, climate on the Earth is based on many inputs, uh, the sun's energy, the reflection of the sun's energy to our space, the capturing of the energy by means of gases that they are in the atmosphere. But these balances are affected by many different different factors and feedbacks. And uh, we, we actually seen already the feedbacks that they are out of our control. And the ones who we do have control, we are doing nothing and we are increasing the amount of activity creating this um, runaway potential temperature. Um, the, Sea level rises could be from several meters, five, six, seven meters by the end of the century, which means Miami will be underwater, New York will be just abandoned. And, uh, and this is less than a hundred years. We are talking about decades. And we're still doing nothing. And we are talking about religion, whether we should uh, bring condoms to Africa or, or, or allow women to have abortions. And so the, 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 the conversation it runs around non-issues, uh, issues that they, in the long run they don't mean nothing. But we are going to be dying from hunger or, or, or being suffocated by temperatures. Uh, what, what difference does it make if you believe in God or you don't believe in God? Uh, God is not going to come and bring you a, an air conditioner or anything. <laughs> so, so we we really have to excite people in a way that they are willing to act. 
And I have to remind you that people in the Northwest who are hanging on a tree trying to prevent this pipeline that is going to bring petroleum that is not going to stay here, as was mentioned. Uh, uh, so people have partial information. They think that the petroleum that is going to come from the hard sands is for us. But it's going to be exported. It's just, it's just a, a ridiculous thing. But uh, these people are trying to stop that pipeline, and they are being charged with terrorism. <coughs> And they are being threatened to be killed because they come with this machine knocking the trees where they are in. We are in a, not in a democracy. We are in a, some kind of a fascist state. And we are running away. I'm Michael Foley. And I am really, really glad to be here tonight. Because <laughs> Wade, I admire you. Now, Pat Butler. You showed yourself to be a slave of the empire, this business, but oh, Miss Wade, why don't you give it up and just compromise with the Democrats? Ask the Democratic Party to help you get you the wrong. Anyway, I'm the guy, I've said it many times, when you vote for a Republican or when you vote for a Democrat, you're voting for sodomy, because that's what they do to us. Now, People say, well, who are you going to vote for? And I say there's a lot of third-party candidates. Miss Wade is one of them. She's right here tonight. She's an intelligent human being. She's well-spoken. And she says she has the priority one qualification for public office. She doesn't take bribe monies from the establishment or from the empire. That in itself should qualify her for public office. Most of these Republicans and Democrats, they start taking their bribe money before they even decide to run for office. They form an exploratory committee to decide whether or not they should run for office and they start collecting campaign contributions. And if the money starts rolling in, then they say, hell yeah, I'm running for public office. I'm making a million dollars a year at this. Now, as far as your agenda and your program this way, there's a lot of good things about it, but there's no money anymore for anybody's agenda or any program. There's probably enough money in the federal budget to pay the federal employees, pay the federal employees of ten, uh, pensions, and that's about it. This country is broke. The best part of your agenda that you maybe should try to implement, that you could implement, because it doesn't cost much money, is the tax reform thing. General Electric Company made $5 billion in profit and paid zero income tax, and that was either in the year 2010 or 2011. Five billion dollars in profit and paid zero income tax. There's absolutely no reason to have a tax code that allows that. And also the welfare companies, General Motors, I've said this before, they got a 185 billion dollar welfare check called a bailout. And part of the bailout was they were free from paying taxes, income tax on any profit they make for the next 10 years. The whole thing stinks. And when decent, worthwhile people get up and say, I'll try to go there and do something about it, there ain't much they can do, but Ms. Wade would be a voice in Washington. Also, she'd be in front of TV cameras, then maybe, but maybe not the TV cameras might still freeze her out, but she would be a voice to talk about intelligent, worthwhile ideas and maybe motivate the general population in this country to do something worthwhile for themselves by kicking out these people whose priority one reason for running for public office is to scam millions of dollars in campaign contributions. They pay them, they're living like Roman emperors, emperors. I said it before, they got lots of money, lots of lackeys, and lots of big titty whores. And that's what they want, and that's why they run for office, and we're the ones getting screwed. I wish you well, Miss Wade. Thanks to the two speakers, very interesting, and I think uh, some of us may think about who we vote for in the next election. Uh, years ago, we had the chance to get rid of the judges that, uh, the political judges, we could have voted for marriage selection when we had the Constitutional Convention. Unfortunately, people my age, us old folks, 
did the wrong thing. I voted the right way, but uh, we they did the wrong thing, uh, and they voted to have the election of judges. That was in the Con Con 1970. There were, uh, you had the Con Con, and then you had five, I think it's five different things you had to say yes or no on, you know. Uh, vote at age 18, death penalty, uh, cumulative voting, and stuff like that. And we voted the wrong way on merit selection, the judges. So we had our chance, old folks, and we goofed it up. Uh -huh. um, as far as uh, the way we're spending money, uh, you know, I'm a left winger, and I am concerned about our debt. Uh, we can correct what we've got if we want to get rid of these expenditures. And, and uh, Nancy Wade talked about the military. That's uh, something for sure that we waste a lot of money on bad banks and uh, other uh, intelligence agencies. We had a speaker in on intelligence agencies. I think there are about uh, 19, he said 24 agencies that deal with uh, intelligence. Uh, of course, uh, they say, well, we got Osama bin Laden. Well, hell, it took them 10 years and we spend $80 billion a year, uh, there is so much waste that we can get rid of without hurting people. I think uh, that's something that if you get into office, I hope you think about uh, cutting a lot of these wasteful expenditures, and then, yes, we need tax reform. That's even worse, so I hope you do that too. Thanks. You're a, pretty, you're a pretty lady, I hope you get elected. But chances are slim, and then if you get elected, you'll get lost in a shuffle. Oh, these progressive people, man, how bad you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> you know now, you are talking among yourself, and I enjoyed it. Okay, so next week, don't, don't get off me, man. You know, you know how corrupt you are, and how crook you are and how bad you are, okay? The, every, every morning I go to work and uh, I touch my computer and uh, I get a feeling that Barack Obama and uh, some progressive have declared a war on entrepreneurs and business people. Oh. Entrepreneurs and business people. And, and, and you, have, you have done it. You, de you demonize, uh, I know, either you don't understand how business works. You have no idea. Yeah, you understand how labor union works, right. You know, and how, how, how it works, how, to shake down the big government, you know that. But uh, it is a war on the Every business feels that thing. Every business feels that thing. And uh, we have the best free enterprise system in the history of humankind. The, the problem we have is this. We do not know what we want. Chinese people, Chinese government told its people that we will do every, everything to help you. You just export the goods, and they do it. You know, uh, German is Angela Merkel. She says, "Hey, Bruno, go and put your work, work hard, and make a good product, and we'll take care of the rest of the thing." And they do it. It works for them. The Singapore, it, it takes the business that, hey, we'll help you everywhere. You make product and export. <coughs> and be a best seaport world can have. And it works for them. Even Hitler, the, the, the genius, he 
female free enterprise world because she told business people that hey, I'll support you. Just you take care of the needs of German people and, and my army. But our government doesn't know what to tell and how to, what we want. We, you know, we want export, we want consumption, we want to help poor, we want to help rich, what we want. Unless we know, we lack clarity and we do not have a clarity. We are not, our government is blotted, our regulations are blotted, and passing uh, the merchants, which Barack Obama has done, is not going to work, have work. You know, the Bain Capital, Bain Capital, Bain Capital, but that's the way business works. You know, because, because uh, steel, our steel industry got destroyed, our steel, our steel industry got destroyed simple. I wa, I, I'm a steel man. I wa, I'm, a, I'm a metal steel engineer. First off, first of all, let's remember. If we don't behave ourselves, we are going to end up getting adult supervision. And what is going to happen is the waitresses will be wearing scrubs. And they will be giving us our medication every half hour. And the manager will be replaced by a big, burly orderly whose job will be to make sure that we stay orderly. Now, we're supposed to behave with, here at the College of Complexes with a level of decorum several notches higher than the British Parliament. <laughs> uh, the type of behavior that we had tonight is about what you would expect in the British Parliament on uh, a, an evening of spirited debate. I'd say my right honorable it's friend fun, is a liar. It's, it's fun <laughs> if you're a member of the British Parliament there is a reason I and my family are no longer connected with that country or its empire. And I am certainly not a slave of the empire. This empire or theirs. Now, Nancy, I was elated, as a matter of fact, at your platform because your platform was something I think any sane person, progressive, moderate Democrat, Lakefront liberal, whatever, uh, union uh, activist could very easily embrace. This was one of the reasons why I suggested that perhaps something like this might be something which could be melded into over a period of time, sooner rather than later, the platform of one or of the other of the major parties, I suspect the Democratic Party. I hearken back to, most of us remember the 1960s, the days of the civil rights demonstrations, which were started by what were described in the South as French groups. However, in 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed into law uh, a, a set of requirements, basically including a lot of the things that Martin Luther King, once the outcast, had marched for and organized for. It became part and parcel of the Democratic Party's platform for that year. It became the law of the land. So also, many of these things were the law of the land at one time. They were allowed to lapse. You pointed out the national parks, our natural resources. Teddy Roosevelt, who was a Republican president, but more progressive, in fact, than many Democrats of our own era, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is the guy to whom we owe our national parks, uh, the beginnings of our environmental consciousness in this country. Uh, these are the kinds of things that with a little bit of intelligent, well-placed pressure uh, in the right places can become part and parcel of party doctrine. Now purists are going to say, why be co-opted by one party or the other? 
The fact of the matter is, and, and, and maybe this is my fault because I tend to be a very goal-oriented guy, I don't particularly care about the sincerity of your motives as long as you get done what I think is a good idea. I'm for you. You and your motives can be discussed with your priest in the confessional uh, as long as it becomes the law of the land uh, in the end. So uh, if, if, if I appear to be somewhat less than an idealist, that's probably true. I call myself a compassionate pragmatist. I want to see at the end of the day, much, uh, my time is running out, much of your ideas become the law of the land. But I think it's going only going to be done by one of the major parties unless you can become a major party very, very quickly. And I sincerely wish you luck. I really do. Well done, Governor. I have some other issues, but um, <clears throat> to add to Pat Butler, um, the uh, article that I recommended before by Lauren Langman and Logos also, uh, also discusses some of the changes that Obama has incorporated uh, this, uh, during the last four years, ideas that he actually took from Occupy, which stays out of Wall Street and out of Main Street. Uh, but uh, just as far as, as your ideas, again, who wouldn't embrace them, uh, use and, and use wrong. Um, I see war and religion as the, the myth of uh, self-destructive part and irrational part in humanity that goes, a lot of people vote for reasons that go against their own self-interest and survival. Um, as far as the debt, there's only, debt I'm not sure, uh, yeah, war and, and the way we spend is the, the issue, but Paul Krugman, whose ideas I respect very much, claims that actually um, increasing the debt is not a bad idea and the uh, spending uh, is the only way to really get jobs and the economy back to some kind of functioning level. Um, but the main uh, point here that I, I think I brought up before with the question is about Congress. Um, the, the system itself is so sick and is so built to fail that to have some, a few good representatives, I'm not sure is going to do it. Um, and yes, you had some ideas about campaign money, and I think campaign money is a huge issue, but that will require an amendment, and who knows how that will happen. I don't know why is it so difficult in this country, but it is. But there are other issues with Congress. Um, there are issues of the conflict of interest in which people who uh, uh, introduce bills or vote for bills for a certain corporation later on go and work for those corporations. There is the, um, uh, the benefits that are completely disconnected from performance. How can we, we uh, reward congressmen and other representatives according to their merit and performance. It should be performance based. You can't just give them pension for life and, um, and health care for life uh, without really um, uh, being uh, accountable. So those are, are, are big issues. And uh, like you mentioned, uh, Martin, is that uh, 85% of our incumbents are unopposed. So we, we, we have a lot of systemic issues that we, we really have to, um, I think, fight uh, fundamentally before we, we, we will be successful at uh, anything else. Um, you mean I still have time? Uh, 16 seconds. 
Um, okay. Uh, I just want again uh, to thank you, Rob, for doing all the work that you are doing for separation of church and state, for all those undue exemptions. Uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, uh, faith is something that is so important that people will never vote for you. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, both of you, for a really good presentation. It's um, it's really enlightening to hear people talk about beneficial solutions to a lot of the problems, rather than what we got in the last two debates with one candidate just standing there bald face lies. And that's how you win a debate. You shower your opponent with lies so they're in a state of shock and if you don't just call them out on the lies in real time while it's happening then it's over. That's what the American public is treated to with the mainstream media. You're, Nancy, you know, the Basically, I made a list of all the things you were talking about. Your entire platform could be implemented virtually overnight, within a handful of years, if the American public wasn't pouring a trillion dollars of our tax dollars down the military rat hole, where our 5% of the world's people spend as much on 800 bases around the world to protect American corporate interests as we spend more money on defenses hey, than the rest of the world combined. And that whole philosophy, the increase in military spending, is being driven by one single mythological event that was sold to us by the American media. And that is the event that uh, was sold as a we were attacked by uh, foreigners on the morning of 9-11. A new Pearl Harbor was created, and then all these other things, um, the warrantless surveillance, anybody can be arrested at any time, spying. This whole infrastructure increase in intelligence is being driven by the myth of 9-11. Now, we're 5% of the world's people. The other 95% have known uh, since shortly after 9-11, they knew within a few days that it was a totally an inside job. The intelligence agencies all over the world knew that. Architects and engineers running that um, program called Explosive Evidence. That's the name of the DVD. The last 20 minutes of that, it has uh, psychologists and psychiatrists in there showing how to help people face reality. There's no debate on what happened anymore. The American people, a large chunk, and you see it with some people in this room who are very intelligent but refuse to face certain segments of reality. It's human nature. And if one, I forget who said uh, some of us old people, uh, we, we mess things up. Well, you know, the question is now, can enough old people face reality so that the grandchildren growing up now, little ones, aren't facing a planet with sea level rises 20 or 30 feet in 40 years? NASA's talking about passing the tipping point in the next two years. So I propose that we help people learn where the beneficial knowledge is being broadcast and spread all over the place. And it's not in the mainstream media. Uh, we're bathed. You talk about energy. Ten, the seventh graders uh, we teach, uh, we teach them that 10,000 times more energy falls on the planet every day in light. We collect one ten thousandth of the solar panels. You wouldn't even have to put up any windmills or anything else. We are totally bathed in alternative energy of all kinds that's vastly cheaper than almost any kind of fossil fuel. It's way cheaper than the new hydraulic fracking, and it's 10 to 50 times cheaper than any kind of new nuclear power plant, even the ones that are hiding under the new name of thorium. It's just an old way to redisguise old billion dollar central plants that are part of our present system is welfare for the rich. We are shoveling welfare to rich people in amounts that haven't been seen since the pharaohs walked the earth. There's, there's nothing else like this happening anywhere on the planet, like what's happening in America. And the simple solution is for Americans just to wake up, face reality, and start implementing good solutions. A good place to start, as I said, is with the, the portal websites. Each one of them is a portal or a doorway into the other world where all the blacked out news is every day. Common Dreams is one of the best. And everybody could get a copy of Project Censor. A book comes out every year called Censor News. 
coming out in two weeks, yes. uh, the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. Anybody well, wants any other information, yes. see me at the end. Yes. Thank you. Oh. All right. Well, I unfortunately I missed a lot of the presentation. Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, anyway, I missed a lot of the presentation because I uh, had to go out. But uh, what I did here, uh, I basically um, I agree with pretty much everything that the, our two speakers said. Now, um, now, uh, in spite of that, um, I'm. Uh, I'm actually I'm supporting the Democrats this year rather than the Green Party. Although I actually, um, although I tend to agree more often with the Greens than I do with the Democrats. Some people ask me why. Well, the reason basically is what Pat Butler said. I don't. Um, I, I like I, I like the Greens as people, but I don't. I don't think they have a very good chance of winning. And and um, and. And and I think that when when the when parties when third parties like the Greens do start to make some headway, uh, the main effect is to break up the liberal vote and uh, and cause the election to go to a Republican. No. Now uh, so I think basically what you have to people have to vote. You know the the, the system tends to work towards a, you know in favor of a two party system. So that uh, so I uh, and. In order, you know, in order to keep the worst guys from from taking over, and it can work the other way too. With re it, and it has in the past. Like for example, Ross Perot broke up, uh, caused the conservative vote to break up, which caused Bill Clinton to get elected president. But the Republicans are very careful to make sure that that sort of thing is not going to happen now. And so, um, so I would agree with. Uh, now, I, I happen to be a member of Democracy for America, as my T-shirt says. You may know it. Uh, and and Democracy for America is a group that embraces uh, values that are pretty that are almost identical to, to what you all are advocating. It's a group founded by Howard Dean uh, back in the uh, I believe in 2004. Um, and and what we do is we run people for office as Democrats. They aren't part of any Democratic establishment, but they run they run for office in the primaries as Democrats, and they try to and 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 sometimes sometimes they win, sometimes they don't, just like in all elections. And um, but what we and and in that but that we have a better we have a, we have more of a record of success of getting getting people elected into office than the Greens do. Um, now, I just want to say you know Raj was talking about um, yeah, that Barack Obama's declared war on on uh, business people. I would just say with all due respect that that's a lot of malarkey. That that uh, if you oh, yeah. listen, I mean Obama is not anti-business at all. <laughs> In fact, if anything, I sometimes wish that he was more. Anti Excuse me, Raj. One fool at a time. Now, the next thing that Raj has to say about business is that is that business just works like Bain Capital. Well, no, it doesn't. A lot of different businesses. Not every single one of them operates like Bain Capital. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, and and speaking of Romney, I just want to say that um, frankly. Uh, Mitt Romney really scares me. I think that if he becomes president, I think we're going to. A lot of us are going to end up being nostalgic for the good old liberal days of George W. Bush. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, just as a, one example, and I, I actually believed four years ago that Romney was a moderate Republican because based on his record as governor of Massachusetts. But when I found out that he actually believes in unitary executive theory. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is this is a theory held by some conservatives that the president has the right to do anything he wants without any accountability from Congress or or the uh, judiciary, and that, that the president should answer to no one. There's, so now they're eliminating all checks and balances. The president is is above the law. Uh, that is basically that is a recipe for dictatorship, and and Romney believes in this completely, and this is. This is a very scary thing, and I just want to say, and, and I didn't realize this, but it was it was way back in I think 07 or 08 that a, a very good friend of mine uh, told me about this and, and alerted me to this fact, and I just want to say that for that I'm very grateful. And um, I just want to say also to you, Pat, that you know I like Teddy Roosevelt as much as you do, but he, he didn't actually start the National Park Service. The first National Park, Yellowstone, was was created by Ulysses S. Grant. Um, and um, and Andy, the defense budget was uh, in this country was very high before 9/11, and and so I think the argument can be made. I don't think 9/11 
had much of an effect on it. I mean, obviously, it has been the uh, it has been the uh, the reason or pretext for wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But I think that even without that, we would still have the highest defense. We would still have the highest military budget in the world. Okay. All right. First of all, I'm going to give a little bit of an idea that is really radical for solutions to our country. And it, if you think about it, it might have a little basis of fact, but it is not my own personal views on this. And I want to make this very clear. So this idea that was I heard on the radio and looked around through other sources is simply this. We can trace our problems back to Jefferson Davis not succeeding. We saw the former Soviet Union break up into several smaller countries, and a lot of those several smaller countries are now prospering, specifically Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Perhaps it might be time to reconsider the issue of secession. Boom. Particularly down to those southern states, where a lot of the southern states get the majority of our capital expenditures. They don't spend their money on schools, they don't spend their money on public roads, and we up north have to bail them out. What would we do if we had home rule in the northern states and the western territories? I'll tell you what we would have. We would have a much more stronger, more unified country, and we could let those southern states secede and do what they want. Let's see what the Republic of Texas will do with their own embassies, having to maintain their own security and their own borders, without Washington having to bail them out. Or Alabama trying to maintain its own public school infrastructure on its own terms, along with its own things. A radical idea? You bet. Maybe, perhaps, it should be the idea of secession may be a viable one. Hey, it worked for Kazakhstan. They're an oil-rich country now. Tajikistan is on its way to becoming a democratic republic, and they're now off the uh, old bailouts of the former Soviet Union. Turkmenistan's another one. And of course, we all know the e-government initiative in East, and I think it's in Latvia, that's been working well, where they have a completely modern government completely on the web. You know, perhaps secession may not be a bad idea. Do I wish it wasn't Dixie? No way. Well, I love uh, Nancy. I love your plan. I love the uh, what the Green Party is doing. Ninety percent in any case. And, uh, you know, bringing back Glass-Steagall, great fairness and taxation, green jobs, universal health care, Medicare for all, single payer, that's a great idea, getting money out of politics, etc. The problem is, I'm, you know, I don't have as high hopes as I wish I could for your success because all of your stuff just makes too damn much sense. You know? And uh, that, that often doesn't go over well in the, uh, you know, in the world of realpolitik. Um, actually, on some things, I don't think you go far enough. I, I know just couple, maybe a couple issues here. Uh, you say get the big money out of politics. I think we should get all the money out of politics, basically. Uh, I think uh, public funding of campaigns completely. I would, uh, I would kill the monster of uh, of uh, the problem with campaign funding. Uh, but at the, de at the demand end, not at the uh, supply end. All of our laws attempt to limit the supply of money that goes into politics. We should kill the demand. TV, uh, uh, TV ads, forbidden. Radio ads, forbidden. Uh, most uh, print ads, except for a few simple things, forbidden. Candidates would get their message out uh, on TV debates for the national and statewide elections. Uh, for local elections, uh, PTA uh, meetings, and, and other local uh, live forums uh, would get the information, allow the candidates to get their uh, story out. Uh, on the, uh, oh, I, I do agree that 
uh, it should be easier to get on ballots. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous system that we have here. Uh, regarding uh, funding of campaigns, Larry Lessig of Harvard wrote a book called Republic Lost. I don't know if you've all read it, but it's, it, it should be read not only by candidates, it should be read by just about uh, all American voters. Uh, regarding taxes, you have the best plan. I don't think it goes far enough getting the top marginal rate back up to 70%. I think it should be back to the Eisenhower era brackets at some point for the very high income people, but that's better than most. Jan Schakowsky, who's one of the more liberal ones, to raise it to 49%. Uh, that's not enough either in this business of, of we're, you know, we're going to make the rich pay more of their share by raising it 4%. Uh, is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's hardly even worth arguing about, and, and uh, it's silly. But the, the Republicans are saying they want to drop it to 25. Well, I think all they're really trying to do is hedge against having it go up to uh, uh, at all. And uh, so that's the problem there. Everybody's asking for something more than they expect to get. Uh, another uh, myth that the Republicans are spreading is that only small business creates jobs. No, government creates jobs too. All right, they create a lot of uh, some good jobs and important jobs. And every time we cut cut government funding, and this is where I maybe disagree with Rob, it's not so much an issue of cutting. We not only we do two things: we take somebody who is who's gainfully employed, and we put them into the roles of the unemployed, and we take a service of some sort, uh, whether it be art teachers or or health care workers or whatever, and we take that service away from people who need it. Okay, so it's so so cutting is, is maybe not the answer. Even defense jobs, uh, we have to think about the fact that there are a lot of defense jobs in in the private sector too, and some of these go away. If we cut that, uh, cut that we have to think in terms of replacing those jobs. We did talk about that. Uh, I think we need a multi-party system. That's one of the reasons that I like the Greens. It's one step toward a multi-party system the way they have in Europe, which is what we. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, what we really need. Do you but thank you very much, and good luck to you. Briefs inside 46. No, we don't go that high. That's okay. Gavin Klein don't go that high, uh, uh, I can't say why not, because there's a lot of fatties around. I know. They don't, they don't sell that many. The designers sell under the They don't print it all the same briefs. Okay. So the big guy don't buy that, don't spend that kind of money. I'd like to see the Greens funds less, but I don't live with the Greens funds. <laughs> most, most big guy, I mean. most, of, yes, um, most of my customers local, are especially on local under level 35. Candidates are green because at least they're saying something that the Democrats and Republicans aren't. And I've always been sympathetic. This leads me to my previous question about um, ballot access. Uh, naturally, uh, being a member of the Socialist Party, we've always tried to get our candidate on the ballot, but we can never get 25,000 signatures. There are the candidates are on the ballot of a few states, but not not Illinois. Well, we discovered a little um, kind of a, a glitch in the in the thing in that all you had to do is to send is to send the. Uh, um, the petition in even with just one signature and unless somebody challenges it uh, it can, uh, they have to accept you on the ballot well th we found this out I think a day or two before the uh, deadline was so we did that just figuring out the Republicans Democrats they're gonna challenge it anyway we won't be on the ballot but yeah we give it give it a try and then we'll think about you know next time well, it turns out the Republicans didn't challenge it, the Democrats didn't challenge it, the Green Party challenged it. <laughs> and uh, Rob here, a man who I've always adored as a fellow atheist, I mean, how could I not? Uh, fellow Jewish atheist. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, but I was really disappointed to hear that he had spearheaded this Thing. And, uh, no, that's not true. There well, are no fans. That's what I heard. Well, that's but, what you heard was a Okay. But, um, and I was disappointed in the Green Party, and I 
I, I didn't know how to feel because for so many years I've had good feelings towards the Green Party and, and, and Rob, but I just keep this in perspective and say, how could they not want everybody to be on the ballot, which is, you know, and if you can get away, if, if you can lose, use their system against them and get on the ballot, why not? Um, to, to be fair, I understand the Socialist Party in New Jersey just recently passed something that said that Socialist Party members couldn't be a member of the Green Party or any other party. Could not. Could not. Good. Which um, most of the Socialist Party, I, I don't know anybody who thought that, but I don't know how that happened, but it just, I just read something that it happened that, that in New Jersey that they were telling, and lots of Socialist Party members or Green Party members also, like myself yeah. and all that. But uh, anyway, that's all I had to say. So. All right, Bill. Come on, Bill. Well, there's a few, couple things that we haven't heard anything about tonight so far, anyway. And that is one. Illinois is supposed to go for Obama. It's supposed to be all wrapped up. What difference does it make if why you vote in the state of Illinois? I think Illinois. The only thing you can do is uh, a protest vote, which I intend to do. It won't be green, it'll be this libertarian guy. He sounds a lot like Ron Paul. But anyway, uh, another thing I haven't heard anything about. What we've heard tonight, I think, <coughs> I think is a pretty good way. You can't get anything done through the political process. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about the economic process, but there are ways that you have to redefine a lot of things to, to try and get things done through the economic process. And uh, I haven't heard anything about that Norman Thomas statement during the 1960s. He said that everything the Socialist Party was pushing for in the 1930s had been adopted by the Democrats. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Where, where we go? First of all, let's begin by thanking both our speakers. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Short Notice, and our candidate here. Best of luck in your campaign. And by the way, if you haven't done it, there's a clipboard here, and please sign up. Get involved in a campaign if you haven't done one before. I'm certainly sure they would appreciate it. Most, I'll tell you what, the big thing, the big driving thing about these campaigns is money. If you can't do anything um, in terms of streetwise uh, campaigning, which is a lot of fun. I really enjoy that myself personally, more so than anything. Uh, send them a little check. It, it would help out the campaign. There certainly are significant expenses attendant to this. Um, I'll leave that there. Let's see, what else? Okay, you know, two things you can do tomorrow regarding all the things that we heard tonight. The first thing you got to do is come to a meeting of the Chicago Greens at 2 o'clock at 1000 North Milwaukee Avenue. And if you haven't been involved in the Greens, it would be a good, good time. Now, if you can't make the meeting, you can go to the website of the Illinois Green Party. And for $25, uh, you can become a member of the Green Party, which I would highly recommend that you do both. But anyhow, if, I've been involved in the Greens for a few years and met some really nice people. And we've seen any number of really, really good qualified candidates here at the College of Complex to speak, and we've heard it some more here tonight. Now, i got to pick on my friend Butler every time he shows up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I recently was in New York, and on Park Avenue, there's a statue of Theodore Roosevelt with some Indians clinging along. I really don't like this statue. But now, I guess your basic supposition is, is that because the Republicans produced an ecological president 
let's say about a hundred years ago, <laughs> that they are suddenly the equal of the Green Party, or they're going to change. Now, this is the party in which, in the acceptance speech, Mr. Romney made a joke about global warming. <laughs> And I think there's some difference of opinion on this. So by the way, Mr. Roosevelt was a city boy. And he might have gone to some dude ranch, but he was not a frontiersman. And I really don't think he was. He was also a deputy sheriff uh, out uh, in uh, Montana, I believe. Oh, yeah, sure. He was a city Yes, he was. He was a mama's boy from New York. <laughs> I like him. I read his history of the U.S., but he was a mama's boy from New York City. Come on. He, what is he, he's no more Buffalo Bill Cody than I am. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about him, but I know you're not Buffalo Well, thank you. <laughs> and the last thing is, I support the we're going to really take this up next week. But if you really think, listen, this is going to be good next week. We've got to get rid of the small businessmen. These guys are ruthless. <laughs> I will never, never take a job in a small business unless you are really, really at the point of starvation. This, these guys will, this will work you to death. <laughs> they will cheat you. They have, have to say that this is the keystone of the American nation. We're, we're really, we better go green. Anyhow, thanks a lot. We had a good time here tonight. All right, next speaker. Roosevelt was a city boy. Hold the microphone down, Dave. All right, with regard to the comments that were made concerning secession, I will say simply this. <laughs> 150 years ago, in 1862, 12,000 people in the United States Army were killed, wounded, captured, or reported missing in a single day. That was at the Battle of Antietam. Those people died, were killed, wounded, or captured in order, among other things, to settle the question of secession once and for all. It's not something that we need to revisit, period, end of story. Can you imagine what would happen today if not just Barack Obama, but any U.S. president suddenly had 12, suddenly had uh, 12,000 casualties in a single day? Ooh. So I don't think we need we need to go back there. With regard to the comments about how things went well in Germany under Hitler, well, all I have to say is, yeah, but at a, at a terrible price with slave labor with Hitler preparing aggressively for war. That's why everybody had a job. He had converted his industry into uh, preparations for war. And some of those people went on, went on trial after the war as war criminals. Um, I'm kind of surprised that you would know nothing about whatever uh, your party's candidate for president's position is on Israel, since it's an important issue. And I might add that I heard nothing tonight that would sway me for my decision to vote for President Obama's re-election. Uh, with regard to your candidacy, I have a candidacy, I live in the 9th District. And you're not running against Jan Schakowsky. Uh There is no war on small business. And I think, think that that's a, lot of, I think that's a lot of nonsense. And I hardly consider Bain Capital, with its exporting of jobs outside the United States, to be a model uh, for the rest of the American economy. Okay. Uh, with regard to certain comments that were made about um, George Romney's uh, and his idea that he's not accountable to anyone, that's what Richard Nixon was thrown out of office for. George Mitt Romney. Mitt. Pardon me. You said George Romney. I did. I, I'm sorry. I withdraw that. Never said that with regard to Mitt Romney, yeah. Mitt Romney and his comments, well, that's what Richard Nixon was thrown out of no, office for. No, it wasn't. And I sincerely hope that Mitt will be defeated. His father, George Romney, was an outstanding public servant. Mitt Romney is not. Nixon was thinking around. Uh, with regard to the defense budget, it didn't start with 9-11. It's been big since World War II, and it never really stopped. And finally, if the economy needs improving, 
We do need to raise taxes, but not by 4%. The top 1 or 2% in America need to have their taxes raised back to where they were uh, under Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. Well, I'd like to thank our speakers tonight for great presentations, and uh, and I especially applaud uh, Bob Sherman's continued efforts on behalf of us atheists everywhere. Even though I live in Indiana, I can't vote for you, but I wish I, I wish I could. But I do support your your efforts 100 uh, percent for separation of church and state. Um, okay, first, Andy, this uh, this you keep talking about 911 being an inside job, you know, which is just so ridiculous. Uh, to think this thing was somehow dynamited. If you go to any office, any big uh, skyscraper, like you came to our office, for instance, and so, somebody would have to come in there at night or something and wire this thing up with explosives, and you have no idea the amount of filing cabinets and paperwork and furniture. I mean, to move that stuff and to do this undetected, I mean, this is just... This is just nutty, you know. I can just see somebody trying to come in my office and crawling under my desk, under the piles of books I have and garbage bags and my old shoes and the cable and the wires. There's so much cable. I can't move a computer or nothing an inch because the cable, so many cables stuck behind my desk and between the wall. I mean, it's just, it's just nuts, you know. And now, who, who bombed the embassies? Al-Qaeda. Who bombed the USS Cole? Al-Qaeda. Who bombed... The, the World Trade Center the first time, Al Qaeda. You know why is it in? So I saw all of a sudden we did Al Qaeda. You know we did it in 2011, I mean 2001. It's just it's just uh, you know totally nutty. It's totally been debunked. And you can go all to the you can go to the PBS. Hey, Bob, I told you you don't get a chance to slander. Me. Wait, one fool at a time. Here. You don't yeah, slander no, people. Sit down. No. Your ideas are nuts. Sit I'm down. not slandering you. I'm slandering your ideas. We have rules. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Rules. I'm so he's talking something. about the you ideas. Just, yeah, you your ideas. Your I'm not slandering you're Andy. You think I'm crazy, and I'm telling you your face. I'm not well, going to put up with it. The idea is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. This answer is false. Well, you believe in crazy ideas. Maybe you're not crazy, but your ideas are crazy. To think that somebody's going to come and set explosives in hundreds of stories is absolutely nuts. It's what happened. And, uh, you had your turn. Uh, so anyway, now on uh, subject of taxation real quick. Um, I'm a Georgist, so, uh, the, so for those of you that don't know, we believe in uh, really the simplest thing, the single tax on land. And if we had a single tax on land, it would solve so many other problems. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's, you know, I don't know, it's, we don't, I don't have enough time to explain it all, but I, I would hope that you guys would pick up a copy of Progress and Poverty, uh, maybe the modernized version uh, uh, edited by, uh, or written by Bob Drake, uh, but based on Henry George's original work. And come to the Henry George School and take a class would be, would be a great thing. Uh, that would, you know, there's plenty of wealth in this country, every, and every month there's this giant transfer from those of us who don't own land uh, to those of us who do own land in the form of rent. And uh, especially the, uh, uh, those that had bought land, you know, years and years ago uh, that are collecting, you know, just, you know, fistfuls of money for, money for nothing, essentially privilege, for having, having a piece of paper that says you can collect a toll from all those who come after you to, you know, for a place to live, work, or play. You have to pay them, you know, uh, money, and sometimes to the tune of six, seven thousand dollars a month if it's a posh location down downtown. Now those of you that lost money on real estate, or housing as they say, well it wasn't the building that you lost money on or the bricks or the mortar. That's not changed in value. The re replacement cost has probably changed very little. It was all strictly location value. In other words it was land value, uh, land speculation. We are a nation of land speculators and I I think it's easier to get the ear of progressives like Greens and Democrats to get moved to the Georgia site than the Republicans. Oh. All right. Candidate gets the last word. Candidate Nancy Way. Where do you begin? I just like to thank everyone for um, responding to what I had to say, and um, I don't have a, a didn't make a long list of notes about who said what, so I'm going to spare you that. I'd just like to thank you for having me here this evening and um, for your kind attention. Thank you. You're gonna, you want a chance, Joe? You can say Good night, everybody. Hey, what about our no, speaker? No, no, but he was not the invited speaker. The invited speaker was Nancy Wade. We have heard 
from our invited speaker. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman uh, came to speak for the uh, Green Party. He has done so at length. Uh, you have have uh, five minutes. We have about one minute <laughs> before. Yeah, what are you All right. talking about, Rob? Come on, crazy. I want to thank yeah. Charles for inviting me to be uh, the invited speaker tonight, along with Nancy. Uh, and uh, uh, a specific thing for uh, Dave in the back there, who asked about uh, the comments about Israel not knowing uh, uh, Jill Stein's position. Uh, I was invited to replace uh, uh, A.J. Uh, uh, Signeri. Uh, yesterday, uh, A.J. said he, he wouldn't be able to make it. So I was an emergency fill-in. But I want to let you know that Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate for president, Jill and I grew up a couple miles apart from each other in Highland Park. We didn't go to the same synagogue, but you can be sure that with somebody named Jill Stein, that Israel would be safe with Jill Stein as president. So it, it, I always enjoy coming to the College of Complexes. I try to get here at least once every 10 years. <laughs> and I'll see you after the next uh, time that the Olympics are in Chicago. And thank you for your time. All right, Brown.